I've done 
but he's even close. Okay, as part of the issue of being a big round table, we need help. If you're interested in helping, see me, see one of the other officers. There's all kinds of roles that you can do. Something that takes an hour of your time, something that takes two or three, or if you want to get on the board, there's plenty of that stuff. Okay, Jim, can you do it? This is Jim Dunn. He's part of the tour committee, him and John Walsh. He's going to talk about the tour coming up. Okay, good evening, folks. Um, we are putting together the Bunger County Cape Fear River Cruise with Dr. Chris Von Bill. It's going to be on October 1st, 10 o'clock, deporti uh, departing from Wilmington. So we're really excited about it. It's $65 a person. Uh, we have a 45-person cap. Uh, we currently have 30 spots that have been reserved. So reach out to me. My email address is um, in the newsletter. And we'll get you in there, and then we'll figure out how to collect the money from you. But it's going to be a great tour, three hours. The ship is in closed air condition. They sell food and coffee and beverages on it. So I think it would be a great, insightful trip. Plus, the captain has been on those waters for ages, and he knows a lot of the spots uh, in addition to what Chris is going to bring to the table. So I uh, hope to see you guys out there, and just RSVP me if you need me. Or reach me at the front of the table tonight, and I'll put your name down and reserve you. Thank you. The nice thing about having Chris on a boat, he can't walk you to death. You got it. He's captured. All right. Now, Sharon Fink will come up and talk about the women's forum. Sorry, guys. You can't go. Sharon? Ladies, this is for you. We're meeting October 30th, which is a Monday at Trinity United Methodist Church. The time is 6 to 8 p.m., promptly at 6. So if you're coming up the sidewalk at 6 o'clock, we've already started. But I guarantee that I can get you out about 8 o'clock. The doors open at 5 o'clock, and we'll have the coffee pot ready for you. We're trying to show how we're giving women special attention, just as they would have had in the mid-19th century. We have two programs. The first one, is sex in the Civil War. And I know a lot of guys wanted to be part of that, but it, I'm sorry, it's for women only. And if you want Dr. Fonville to come and talk to you about it, see John about it. So Dr. Chris Fonville is going to talk about it. He's a retired uh, from the History Department at UNCW, and he will have his books available for sale. It's done in very good taste, and he has a PowerPoint point program he did this about six to eight years ago, and it was quite a sellout. Our second program, after our refreshments, will be Marion Martin, who's a native North Carolinian, and she's going to talk about women in North Carolina during the Civil War. The cost is free for roundtable women. That's the way it's always been. If you have a guest, that fee is $5, and that has not changed for 10 years. Also included will be light refreshments. We try to make them as close to period refreshments as possible. There will be Civil War books by women authors and about women, and they will be available for free. You do not have to sign up ahead of time, which is something new this time, but we expect a large turnout. All the program advertisements have already gone out. But we do need some volunteers to help us. You don't have to bake anything. We just need someone to set up the refreshment table. There'll be a person in the kitchen to guide you. And I've already got a couple people to volunteer for the registration. And if you have any questions, you can contact me, Sharon Fink. I'll give you my phone number. I don't expect that you're going to have your paper and pencil ready to copy this down, but it will be in the newsletter. But it's 330-507-2773 or you can see me after the meeting. I'll hang around here for a little bit if you would like to volunteer or you have any suggestions. Thank you. Hope to see you next month. 
Okay, this gives you an idea of some of the speakers. This is just the first half. You got a great group of speakers. You got Newsom that's coming in, brand new guy, young author, written a couple of books. Uh, and don't miss the December 5th, the uh, photographic extravaganza. That's unique, most roundtables don't get it. Gary Alderman, who's part of the Civil War Trust, has been collecting photographs for ages. So that should be a unique program for everybody. Okay, 50-50, it's $158? $138, excuse me. The winning number is 771-5403. 771-5403. Ah, there she is, right back there. The second ticket is for somebody for a free book at the settler's table. Five three two nine is the last four. Five three two nine. Seven seven one five three two nine. Okay, just see uh, my buddy. Where's he at here? Bruce. Bruce is up front, but he'll be back here at the table. See Bruce, you'll be good to go. Okay, and Ann's going to introduce our tonight's speaker. Well, it's really, really nice to see so many of you here tonight, especially after a holiday weekend. So we really do appreciate that and the effort that you made to be out here. And tonight we've got uh, the beginning of our 2023-2024 program. And uh, we have a brand new speaker for tonight, someone that we haven't had to the round table previously, Max Longley is a contributing author to Emerging Civil War and a freelance writer focused on researching and writing about his primary interests, which are American history and religion. And tonight, he's going to enjoin the two in a discussion about um, Marble Nash Taylor and Edward Stanley, North Carolina's two Civil War Union governors. So let's give a very warm welcome to Max Longley. the governors of North Carolina, loyalty to the Union and trying to rally other Unionists against the Confederacy. When there is a good deal of optimism in the North about uh, the, perhaps restoring the Tar Heel State to her former American allegiance. So the first of these two governors was Marble Nash Taylor, a Methodist minister of Hatteras Island, whose self-proclaimed status as acting governor was bemusedly tolerated by local U.S. troops during the time that the island was a lone U.S. outpost in otherwise Confederate North Carolina. After the Union conquest of much of the coastal area of the state, President Lincoln appointed the, the other governor, Edward, Edward Stanley, a former North Carolina politician and a current Californian, to placate uh, local whites by trying to reinstate the antebellum racial order, 
But this provoked a, a backlash among anti-slavery Northerners, so Stanley's governorship was stormy and basically a failure. Lincoln did not replace him after he resigned. So for uh, our first Union governor, Marble Nash Taylor, in order, to in order to look to his early years, we have to rely on hostile Confederate newspapers who wrote about him when he defected to the North. So uh, uh, we have to view that with caution. So he was born in Bedford County, Virginia, ran away and became an, uh, from an apprenticeship there and went to Franklin County, Virginia. And the Norfolk Day Book would later decide to say that uh, Marble Nash Taylor was uh, committing deeds of darkness of unspecified nature, although I couldn't find other confirmation of that, and there is some evidence to the contrary that he was not de doing deeds of darkness. Now, the uh, Richmond Whig at the same time in 1861 or 62 uh, 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 praises Taylor with faint dams, saying that his father was worthless, but that he, Taylor, showed diligence in his studies and was, pro uh, and was promising. He, he was tutored by an educator named Morgan Kloss, who later came to North Carolina, as, d as did uh, Taylor. All right. And uh, allegedly, while working as a teacher in Virginia, uh, Taylor sought to be a Baptist or Methodist minister in Virginia, but was, uh, uh, did not succeed in that. But after moving to North Carolina, he finally became a Methodist minister apparently under Morgan Kloss's influence, his old teacher. In 1850, he began a series of year-long year postings throughout the 1850s in the state's coastal counties under the North Carolina branch of the Methodist Episcopal Church South, which is the southern and pro-slavery part of the Methodist Church at the time. Now in Onslow County in 1854, the Reverend Taylor wrote to the <coughs> New, New North Carolina Methodist paper about the dangerous influence of the Universalists, the Universal Salvationists, who were uh, headquartered in Richland's on, Onslow County, and he wanted to, as a Methodist Episcopal Church South minister, Taylor emphasized the Northern influence among the Universalists, although they were both Northern and Southern influences in North Carolina. But uh, Taylor wanted to raise funds to counteract this insidious universalist propaganda and to persuade people that not everybody necessarily gets into heaven. And uh, in 1856, writing from Bladen County, uh, Reverend Taylor gave some prophetic warnings. In another letter to the Raleigh Christian Advocate, which was the Methodist state paper, he quoted from a popular theological book, warning ministers against spiritual pride that ministers were tempted to make a display of our own glory. There was a lot to warn against since Methodists and uh, Methodist ministers were very influential at the time. Methodists had more churches in North Carolina than other denominations. And throughout the country, that was similar things were happening. Peter Cartwright, you will see on the right, uh, a Northern Methodist minister who ran against Abraham Lincoln and Charles Forrest Deems, you'll see on the left, the most prominent Methodist minister in North Carolina. They, Methodists wrote, ran moral crusades like temperance, for example, Sabbath observance, and in the north, running against slavery, but not in the south because that had been the cause of the split between the two branches. Uh, so Marble Nash Taylor would seem subject to the temptations himself of spiritual pride, as subsequent events would indicate. In 1857, he uh, married Catherine Monroe uh, in Fayetteville, where he was ministering at the time. And uh, also, he, apparently from his in-laws, he did ac acquire a property in Robeson County with about eight slaves. Now, in early 1861, Reverend Taylor was assigned to Hatteras Island. Now, a, a letter a few years before had described the Hatteras Islanders as all, all Methodists or under Methodist influence and love everything connected with Methodism and no other denomination at, before the war was there to rival the Methodists. And uh, one source later wrote that uh, it was the Methodist minister on Hatteras Island who punished lawbreakers, that their meeting house was simple, homely, and for use, and uh, the local people on Hatteras Island made their living from fishing and selling tea. There was no 
tourist trade at the time. Uh, Taylor's uh, wife excited some excitement from her genu genuine hooped skirt, which uh, some women tried to imitate by making their own bamboo skirts. And, uh, the res and the inhabitants of Hatteras Island often had their houses literally built on sand, so if Reverend Taylor wanted to use that as a basis for some of his sermons, he certainly could do so. All right. Now, the island soon had visitors in 1861, but these were not tourists. These were Confederate soldiers and enslaved laborers building two new forts near Hatteras Village, Forts Hatteras and Clark, because the rebel authorities wanted to uh, attack northern commerce, so they had commerce raiders, commerce raiding ships based on Hatteras Island, who would pr uh, prey on the northern shipping, and the Confederates were there to guard uh, that in order to make sure that the no north didn't put a stop to their fun. So the uh, uh, Confederate troops fought off mosquitoes and drank, despite the presence of a Baptist chaplain, who, sh who, who of course, was trying to exercise his influence, F.V. Hoskins. And uh, allegedly, Taylor was, and Hoskins were both praying for the Confederate troops uh, during, their st during their stay. But finally, President Lincoln got tired of the complaints about northern merchants, about the commerce raiders, so he sent uh, Silas Stringham, the flag officer of the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron, with a Union naval force to take Hatteras Island. And a Confederate witness would later say, uh, claiming others could back him up, that having uh, recently prayed for the Confederate soldiers, Taylor waved with his hand to the Federal troops where to land. He then pointed out the locality of the Confederate forces in the bushes, and in a few minutes, the Federal troop uh, forces were through shells there. When their men landed, Taylor, allegedly, according to the same source, went towards them, took off his hat, and swung it around his hand, head in welcome. And so on, anyway, w whether we take that narrative of Taylor's role as true, anyway, on August 29th, the forts fell. A federal garrison was then stationed on Hatteras. The Confederate forces tried to reconquer Hatteras Island, but they were driven off at Chickamacomico. Uh, some civilians also left the island at this time. There was some looting on both sides, but um, Hatteras Island was now a U lone Union outpost in otherwise Confederate North Carolina. And Northerners rejoiced at this victory, the Hatteras Island victory, because it came so soon after their surprising defeat at First Bull Run. So perhaps um, with this victory, the Northerners were more inclined to may exaggerate the importance of, of their triumph. So they were perhaps disposed for what uh, the publicity that came later. Now, the federal commander at Hatteras was Colonel Rush Hawkins, whose New York Zwave Regiment was joined to other elements in order to form his command. Hawkins wanted to use Hatteras Island as a base from which to seize the coastal areas of North Carolina. Here, he thought, he would be able to release what he considered the pent-up Union sentiment of Tar Heels, organize a government loyal to the Union to compete with the Confederate government. As he put it, uh, one-third of North Carolina would be back in the Union within two weeks. For now, Hawkins's plan was not carried out, uh, and Hatteras remained the sole federal enclave. But meanwhile, uh, Marble Nash Taylor, uh, and possibly uh, someone whom we'll we will soon meet named uh, Charles Henry Foster, uh, held what they called a convention of Hatteras, loyal Hatteras citizens, loyal to the US. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, in, as a personal note, Reverend Taylor wrote to uh, his Confederate brother-in-law in Raleigh saying, oh, he'd been pressured by force of circumstances to, to take his position he was taking. But uh, in his public statements, in, like in this convention, uh, Taylor was much more vigorous uh, in his unionism. He, he was unambiguously pro union So Oct October 12th, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this convention said, uh, it should, issued a manifesto preparing to depose all the Confederate sympathetic officials in North Carolina and to declare that the establishment at an early day of a provisional state government for the loyal people of North Carolina was needed. And they had a lengthy Declaration of Independence style condemnation of the Confederates, although at this time they didn't actually set up a provisional government. Uh, so th this article is from the New York Tribune, which was very uh, optimistic about the pro-union developments in North Carolina from Hatteras Island as we'll see, maybe overly optimistic. And, uh, but meanwhile, 
uh, President Lincoln approved a mission of mercy, as he called it, for Reverend Taylor and William, Thomas William Con Conway, Baptist chaplain for the Union Garrison at Hatteras. They both would go north to New York uh, to raise funds for the Hatteras Islanders who had been uh, cut off from their trade you know, across the Sound to the to Confederate occupied North Carolina, so they were going hungry. So a packed meeting at New York City's Cooper Union Institute is addressed by many prominent men, and we'll meet two of them later, Ambrose Burnside and Francis Lieber. Taylor receives thunderous applause as he describes his people's loyalty and the suffering that they have to endure because of it. Reverend Taylor is even prevented from, is even promised ex extra time to speak if he needs, he needs it, time which was taken away from other speakers. So if ever a minister needed to remember the warning against spiritual pride, it was now. Uh, Reverend Taylor, a, a small town preacher, being applauded at a mass meeting at America's metropol metropolis. So they raised some funds at, at this meeting, administered by a committee of distinguished New Yorkers, including Teddy Roosevelt's father. Uh, and meanwhile, the inhabitants themselves at Hatteras Island were beginning to make some of their own money working for the Union troops, selling to them. So that crisis uh, uh, of impending, potential impending starvation was averted. Meanwhile, however, uh, we need to introduce another character to our drama, Charles Henry Foster, who would be something of a bad influence on Marble Nash Taylor. Before the war, Foster went from being a Maine abolitionist to being a pro-slavery newspaper editor in Virginia and North Carolina. Then, as the war started, Foster went back to st supporting the northern side. In mid-1861, from the safety union lines, Foster wrote fake news dispatches, as we would call them, claiming to come from Confederate uh, occupied North Carolina and giving, you know, courageous missives about how they were really pro-union and just waiting for a chance to prove it, and maybe to, and maybe how Foster himself would get a, a, a regiment or a congressional seat to, to, as a representative of, the, of this union sentiment, but uh, the New York Tribune. Uh, was very influential, and so its editor, Horace Greeley, seems to have believed these uh, tall tales, uh, which were pro widely promulgated. And uh, now, and Foster now moved to Hatteras Island himself after the Union took it over so that he could pr promote his schemes. And it seems that Taylor was about as uh, gullible for Foster's tall tales as, as Horace Greeley had been, per as persuadable. And uh, so that's why they became. Uh, partners, you said, and, and that article is uh, one of the fake news articles from f that Foster made about the alleged unionism and that he, his fake visit to North Carolina. Now, uh, Foster had gone to New York with Taylor on that mission of mercy that I've described, the relief mission, but Foster had focused on getting signatures from expatriate North Carolinians in New York in uh, supporting the idea of a, of a union government a pro-union government in North Carolina. And so now after uh, Taylor and Foster came back to Hatteras, then uh, probably under Foster's influence, Marble Nash Taylor concocted another convention, a second convention on November 18th. This was basically like six or eight people, including Foster and Taylor, but uh, again, in places like the New York Tribune, this was br basically broadcast as a, as a great grand unionist convention for the, for the state. Uh, and the uh, main action of the convention was to appoint Marble Nash Taylor as the provisional governor of North Carolina. And uh, Taylor would be issuing proclamations and raising money for his government by selling copies of these proclamations. But meanwhile, uh, he was also continuing as a minister. The uh, Oliver Bosby Shelley, one of the Union officers occupying Hatteras, uh, in his memoirs recollected Taylor's continued activities as a minister, a gentlemanly looking man, very affable in manners, quite an interesting conversationalist, an avowed unionist, and strongly in favor of cutting Hatteras loose from the Confederate government of the mainland. And in this particular, Taylor was in favor of secession. Now, the, the North Carolina Conference of the Method, Methodist Episcopal Church South in December 1861 expelled Taylor without a trial for his support of the union leading uh, North Carolina Methodist Charles Forrest Deems, who I've mentioned, had uh, deplored Hatteras's fall, and he was a key figure in getting Taylor expelled 
The resolution of, ex resolution of expulsion said that Taylor was a traitor to his Methodist conference, his state, and the Southern Confederacy. Uh, and an uh, interesting note that Charles Forrest Deems, who helped expel Taylor for treason, later, at the end of the war, took a different tune, said that the uh, Methodists, keeping thinking of the Northern Methodists, should not be taking sides on issues of treason or disloyalty. What has any church to do with loyalty or treason in regard to any particular clergyman or layman? It is a matter for the state to decide. But uh, it was too late for Taylor by that time. By the, by, he had already been expelled. So now, uh, so now Taylor, under influence of his new friend Foster, orders elections uh, tolerated by the occupying Union troops. Basically, the uh, inhabitants of Hatteras cast ballots, uh, a smattering of ballots for Foster to send him to Congress as the loyal representative from North Carolina. So uh, Foster goes to Washington and uh, the House of Representatives looks at it and is not, not persuaded, not, not, uh, not overwhelmed. They decide that uh, Fo Foster is trying to put, this fo put something f on them by bad faith and refuse to seat him. Meanwhile, uh, in early in 1862, General Ambrose Burnside, who we've seen as a, a speaker at the Hatteras Relief Rally in Cooper Union, he led a Union invasion launched from Hatteras Island of uh, uh, much, of the, much of the rest of coastal North Carolina. They took Roanoke Island, New Bern, Moorhead City, Beaufort, Elizabeth City, and North Carolina's Washington. An account by a Confederate veteran after Marble Nash Taylor's death said that the Reverend Taylor, uh, after Burnside won the victory at Roanoke Island, uh, presided at a Thanksgiving service for the, for the Union victory, but uh, the Reverend Taylor didn't pray specifically for the Union. He left those prayers to members of his so-called Governor's Council. And according to this uh, posthumous report about Taylor, Taylor reportedly justified his, amb his ambiguous attitude by saying he had friends on both sides. So uh, we have accounts of him being more ambiguous than his public statements indicated. So whether, what credit we would give to these accounts, be, bearing in mind they were somewhat later. So this is the last we hear of Taylor during the Civil War. He may have left the island, uh, a later a history by the Methodist Episcopal Church South of the Methodism on Hatteras mentions two other ministers, not Taylor, as serving the uh, as being faithful preachers serving the island. So uh, where Taylor went during the Civil War, not sure. The Confederates wanted to publish notices that they were going to seize his property, but they didn't know where he was either. His Robinson County property that I've mentioned. Now in Union-occupied coastal North Carolina, of course, the political situation was in flux by April 1862. Fugitives from slavery were fleeing the Confederate parts of the state. There was a freeman's colony on Roanoke, but how could uh, the Union help these black inhabitants without alienating the local whites who were still uh, attached to their uh, racial prejudice, prejudices and uh, so forth? The North still had hopes of rallying the loyal whites, returning them to their U.S. allegiance, and the whites in coastal North Carolina were mercurial, some shifting from the Confederate to Union sympathies and then back again, depending on the fortunes of the war. So could this loyalty be solidified, could it be consolidated? So um, as Taylor recedes into the background, President Lincoln appoints one Edward Stanley as the military governor of North Carolina. This is a month, this is at a time when Lincoln is appointing military governors for Tennessee, uh, Louisiana, and Arkansas. He's thinking to try the same thing with North Carolina since these are all Union occupied areas. Uh, the idea being to mobilize loyal white sentiment for the Union and two of, uh, William, uh, two of Edward Stanley's friends, William Seward, Secretary of State, Reverdy Johnson, a Maryland War Democrat, recommended uh, Stanley, a uh, Californian and former North Carolina politician, for Lincoln's attention. So Lincoln says, tries, decides to give him a try. Uh, so although the Union policy towards slavery was still in flux, so St Stanley was a move in the favor of keeping the status quo, while at the same time in 1862 there were other mo uh, motions toward the other direction. So let's take a look at uh, uh, Edward Stanley, starting with his 
Father John Stanley. So now stop me if you've heard this one before. A founding father, a signer of the Constitution, is killed by another politician in, du in a duel. Founding father in question is Richard Dobbs Spate of North Carolina, and the uh, politician who killed him was John Stanley of North Carolina, Edward Stanley's father. So uh, despite or because of his dueling propensities, John Stanley went on to a distinguished political career. Only Spate's relatives objected. The Stanleys were often involved in duels or near duels. For instance, two of John's brothers, uh, Edward Stanley's uncles, uh, were killed in duels. But John Stanley, uh, who had been victorious in his duel, rose to Speaker of the U.S. House, uh, which was then called, uh, I'm sorry, of the North Carolina House of Representatives, which was then called the House of Commons. So John Stanley dies 1833. Following in his father's footsteps, Edward Stanley, the most promising of John Stanley's sons, uh, rose in North Carolina politics associated with uh, the New Bern, Washington, North Carolina area, the area that's later going to get occupied by the, by the federal government. Uh, he rises as a Whig in these areas. He uh, serves some time as a speaker of the North Carolina House of Commons, and that's sandwiched in between a couple of terms in Congress as a, as a Whig. Uh, so as a Whig pro-union congressman, uh, Edward Stanley was zealous, zealous nationalist, promoting an active, fed, active federal government. This is the, during the 1850 controversies over uh, the compromises and so forth, and uh, the early 1850s. Personally anti-slavery, as he confided in a private letter, Stanley nevertheless defended Southern slavery in public, especially against Northern attack. He opposed the Wilmot Proviso, which would have kept slavery out of the conquered Mexican territories. He defended Northern Whigs against accusations of abolitionism. His vision was of a united country, putting slavery aside and cooperating North and South together on common goals, like infrastructure projects. Stanley expressed confidence that nor the North would do uh, justice to the South, that is, preserve slavery, that is, which is his version of justice. Stanley's opponents were the Southern rights crowd who didn't trust the North to protect slavery and increasingly threatened secession. Stanley largely stood for the 1850 Compromise, uh, including the admission of California as a free state, and he opposed the threats of secession that were, that were uh, increasing. So uh, because of this conflict between uh, Stanley and the Southern rights crowd, one of the Southern rights congressmen, Samuel W. Inge, of Democrat of Alabama, baited Stanley, accused him of not doing enough for Southern interests. Stanley said Inge had little sense and less charity. Inge called Stanley a blackguard. Stanley said Inge was the blackguard and denounced noisy traitors who seek the applause of the grog shops. So we might see where this is going. Inge challenged Stanley to a duel, and Stanley accepted. And Jefferson Davis was Inge's second because they're both strong Southern rights people, so they kind of stuck together. Inge and Stanley harmlessly exchanged shots and patched matters up. And this was America's last duel based on congressional debates the last congressional duel. So Stanley lived up to his family's reputation. But in 1853, running a bit low on money through his political activities, Stanley moves to California, uh, not to mine for gold in the gold rush, but to mine for legal clients. And he built up a good civic and legal reputation over the next four years. And so the Republican Party, uh, which was just finding its feet in California in 1857, nominated, no, nominated Stanley for governor of California. Stanley denounced slavery, condemned the Dred Scott decision, and the repeal of the Missouri Compromise. He didn't want to meddle with slavery in the South, but he wanted the West kept free of slavery so that white settlers could flourish there without competing with slave labor. But the overwhelming victor in the election was the guy at the top of the slide, which is John B. Weller, the pro-slavery Democrat. So, by 1862, Stanley is called again from private life by President Lincoln himself, this time not to be governor of California, but to be governor, military governor of North Carolina. And so uh, to, uh, his, his first tri trip is to Washington, D.C. to consult with Lincoln, so he goes down the California coast across Panama, which didn't have a cannon at the time, he just had to cross the land part, then up uh, to uh, New York, and uh, then to consult with Lincoln about whether he would become uh, the military governor of what amounted to his old congressional district, the Union-Occupied Territory of North Carolina. 
So uh, the, war, uh, the War Department agreed to authorize Stanley to exercise the authority of a military governor, but didn't say where exactly Stanley's authority ended and the authority of the Union Army and Navy began. Nevertheless, General Burnside, the occupying commander in, in Union-occupied North Carolina, was instructed to help Stanley. So Stanley, accepting Lincoln's mission, said that he had a most noble, yes, a heavenly mission, to aid in establishing peace in our beloved country. He called it a mission of love to offer the olive branch of peace on honorable terms. So, after tr uh, tr so according to Stanley, uh, Lincoln gave uh, assurances that there would be no wholesale emancipation. Stanley, uh, and, at the, and he was, at the time, Lincoln was repudiating the uh, Emancipation Proclamation of uh, General Hunter, uh, which, which Lincoln reserved emancipation for himself, and so Lincoln, uh, Stanley believed, would not engage in wholesale emancipation. So he went down to New Bern to take up his duties as a military governor of North Carolina. And then, at this, also in New Bern, was Vincent Collier, the General Burnside superintendent of the poor, who gave charitable aid to the poor in the occupied district, and he had recently opened up white and black schools. And then promptly Collier and Stanley had an interview in which the new military governor, Stanley, said that approving a black school would do harm to the Union cause by alienating the whites. Plus, Stanley added, North Carolina, for, North Carolina law forbade the education of slaves, and many uh, of those in these schools were in fact slaves or fugitives from slavery. I had been sent, Stanley supposedly said, to, to restore the old order of things, that is to say the old racial order of things. So Collier, Vincent Collier, closed his black schools uh, and Stanley thanked him for it, but Collier then went, proceeded to go up north and raise opposition against Stanley, saying that he'd been ordered to close his school, that uh, Stanley was now pursuing a pro-slavery policy. Uh, and uh, at the same time as this was going on, Stanley was actually trying to persuade uh, sl slaves to return to, to, to slavery. S slaveholders wanted Stanley to return their, fug their fugitives. Uh, and so on one case, he made, took an oath of loyalty from one owner and then appealed to the uh, slave to voluntarily return. And US troops liberated that slave. But meanwhile, the uh, fugitives in the area, the Union occupied area, began to go into hiding, fearing that Stanley would start uh, voluntarily returning them, too, to slavery. In fact, Stanley was limited in his ability to re uh, re recover fugitives because Congress had forbidden cooperation from the Army and Navy in returning these fugitives. Stanley did suggest to local whites that they could form civilian slave-hunting posses, but by now the backlash was developing so badly in the North that this turned out not to be uh, feasible. The, uh, and you'll see on the left, Senator Charles Sumner, and on the right, uh, Representative John Hickman, two Republicans in Congress who uh, demanded that the Lincoln administration explain Governor Stanley's policies in North Carolina, his seemingly pro-slavery policies, and his closing of schools. So Lincoln told Vincent Collier, the, the schoolmaster, that Stanley had no instructions to enforce North Carolina's slave laws, and that no fugitives would be returned. Uh, Burnside backed up Stanley by saying that uh, Collier had been exaggerating, that Stanley, uh, and Stanley protested he never wanted to enforce the North Carolina's anti-black education laws. Instead, Stanley offered his resignation if he, if he had lost confidence of the Lincoln administration, but um, it was patched up, the schools reopened uh, for, the, for black and white. Uh, Collier told the public that he had misunderstood Stanley. Stanley said that the slaves could only return if they went voluntarily, and he didn't resign. But during this controversy, this provided the opportunity for the, uh, well, I, Professor Stanley Lieber, uh, who we know as the author of the uh, Rules of War for Union Armies in the Field. This is like uh, shortly before he wrote these, he wrote an editorial saying that, in fact, in Union-occupied territories, the Union had the duty to recognize the freedom of fugitive slaves, that even within the uh, uh, you, any, any fugitives must be treated as free. So this was a kind of a kind of an opening salvo in uh, Stanley Francis Lieber's uh, discussion of the, the law of warfare and its application to 
union uh, union operations. Uh, so that's a, and and Stanley was the uh, supposed occasion for him to write that essay. So that's an important part of uh, important part of military uh, history history of military law. So now Stanley, as I said, he's uh, decided not to resign. Uh, so he focuses on his peacemaking efforts uh, on trying to plead for the North Carolina, North Carolina whites to get out of the war. So on June 17th, 1862, he speaks at his old hometown, Washington, North Carolina. He denounces secession, calls on North Carolina to quit the Confederacy. Secession, he said, was a plot by evil politicians uh, which the North would crush. And, Lincoln, and Stanley said that Lincoln would restore the blessings of Union, blessings which were the best since the time God expelled the first secessionist from heaven. So Stanley's advice was give up promptly or use, lose your slaves. In 12 months time more, said Stanley, there were, would be no room in North Carolina for a slave's foot. Stanley even tried to correspond with his old Whig colleagues in Confederate-occupied Raleigh, but he was rebuffed. Naturally, the Confederate authorities didn't recognize him as governor, and they treated him as a renegade. But nevertheless, Stanley optimistically told Lincoln that North Carolina would be willing to leave the war uh, and, uh, gra and gr approve a gradual emancipation policy. And there was even Confederate fears that Stanley had agents in the Confederate parts of North Carolina to bring North Carolina out of the war. And his other uh, part of his policy to help uh, promote Union s sentiment in the Union U.S. occupied areas of North Carolina. He was trying to relax the naval blockade, which the Navy had imposed on a tra coastwise trade, uh, and he tried to allow more tr uh, co commerce among North Carolina coastal cities and even abroad. But uh, here he met resistance from the Navy. Uh, once again, he offered his resignation. Uh, once again, as military governor, once again, he decided not to resign. And uh, he tries to liberalize freedom of movement within the interior of his district. And he also report, responds to reports of depredations by Union troops. And according to his version, according to Stanley's version of events, there was scarcely a day in which I was not called upon to interpose in behalf of some poor Negro treated inhumanely by some abolition soldier. That's his version. Now, Burnside, meanwhile, uh, was transferred out of commanding the occupation in North, Car North Carolina to moving to Virginia and his dubious fame there. Uh, and he was replaced by General John Foster, not the same person as Charles Henry Foster, was John, General John Foster, the new ocu occupation general. So now, uh, having he had talked again to Lincoln in Washington, D.C., uh, the national capital, and shortly after the Emancipation Proclamation came out, uh, he wanted to find some loophole. Uh, Lincoln said that uh, he had been pressured into it because uh, uh, the Northern Radicals would have cut off support for the war if there had been no Emancipation Proclamation. But uh, Stanley, did, uh, he was hoping that by preserving slavery in North Carolina, or at least the, the Union part of it, he could... Uh, still appease the white population. And so there was a loophole that uh, by organizing congressional elections, sending a loyal co congressional delegation to Washington, D.C., then, then that would uh, uh, allow that loyal part of North Carolina to keep its slaves. But uh, the dilemma here was that uh, the, the, favorite, the favorite, the candidate most likely to win uh, the congressional election was be uh, Charles Henry Foster, who we've met before with his machinations with uh, Marble Nash Taylor, and Charles Henry Foster was uh, busy recruiting poor whites for the Union regiments, uh, and eventually commanding one himself, and Foster's platform was freeing the slaves, maybe sending them away, leaving room for f uh, free white labor it, to take its place. Stanley thought that this uh, free labor movement was uh, wicked and run by bad men, so he could, so he delayed holding a congressional election until uh, January 1st, 1863, the day of the final Emancipation Proclamation. So uh, it turned out that, that uh, the slaves were decreed liberated throughout North Carolina by the final proclamation, no, no exempt districts. But uh, also he, he managed, Stanley did manage to get his own personal candidate, Jennings Piggott, to win the congressional election, but the House 
rejected Piggott, uh, for as not enough, they had not enough voters in the district, the Union occupied territory, and Piggott didn't even live in North Carolina to begin with. So that was another failed initiative on, on Stanley's part. So after the uh, Emancipation Proclamation, the upshot was that the slaves in all of North Carolina were to be free, uh, black soldiers were to be recruited. Uh, this was all against what Stanley thought would conciliate the whites, and he said that uh, this would... Uh, sub so Stanley submitted his resignation on January the 15th. He said that this pro Emancipation Proclamation crushes all hopes of making peace by any conciliatory measures he foresaw direful calamities to the slaves as, as well as whites. So Stanley hung on for just over a month longer uh, until early March 1863, protesting both the Confederate depredations uh, on North Carolina civilians and Union depredations. So after he, he left North Carolina in 1863, Stanley went back to California uh, and facing public criticism for his alleged pro-slavery policies in North Carolina, he wrote a defense of his course as military governor, and then after the war, he became a supporter of uh, Andrew Johnson's reconstruction policy, and uh, to his mind, to Stanley's mind, only a small minority of black people should vote, and any gesture toward equal rights would encourage intermarriage, which he uh, said was a, a bad thing. He retired to a California ranch in 1868. He died 1872. Uh, but now we can turn back briefly to Marble Nash Taylor, uh, pick him up again. He uh, first comes up again in 1868, uh, the unofficial predecessor to Governor Stanley, who's now maybe looking a little bit better now that Stanley has made such a, a, a botch of things. So in 1868, we find Marble Nash Taylor in Fayetteville, He's one of a list of magistrates appointed by Republican go Governor William Woods Holden, and uh, Taylor gave many speeches for the Republican Party and presided at local party conventions. Perhaps as a reward for this, he was appointed superintendent of the Cumberland County uh, Fayetteville Poorhouse. Well, one night, the Ku Klux Klan visited his house, shaved his mule or horse, and someone probably in the Klan sent him a death threat. So uh, Marble Nash Taylor had evolved from actually being a slaveholder in Robeson County to being a, a target of the Klan, but, years after, but uh, again, a story about him years after his death by a local Democrat uh, said that uh, Taylor was beyond reproach, had blameless private life, charity towards all men. The only thing the speaker could, could reproach in him was his membership in the Republican Party. Now, uh, the, maybe, maybe Stanley wasn't entirely that awesome because he did, after losing his job at the uh, poorhouse. He did brawl, had a fight with one of his in-laws, perhaps as part of a squabble which uh, reached the courts. Uh, in 1877, Marble Nash Taylor and his wife were confirmed in the Episcopal Church by a Bishop Theodore Lyman, who was sympathetic to Methodism. So, but what else he was doing during the 1870s uh, is not clear. In 1880, Marble Nash Taylor moves to Moore County, North Carolina. His wife, uh, Catherine apparently was dead, and so it seems were his religious faith. He picked up the reputation of an infidel among his neighbors. He also struck neighbors as fairly melancholy. Now he's a fruit tree salesman and not a minister. He's not very communicative about his past, but uh, he did say he'd been forced by circumstances into the pro-union position he had taken in 1861. This is somewhat like what he'd said, reported to have said before. So in Moore County, his neighbors addressed him as governor, a uh, turn of respect, perhaps mockery, but pro probably respect. But then his daughter's elopement upset him, so he wouldn't call her by her married name. So a local resident much later summed up uh, Marble Nash Taylor, a local Moore County resident, as a starkly built man, under average height, with a Teddy Roosevelt mustache. That's why I have a photo of Teddy Roosevelt there. Uh, he was a dour, taciturn man, uh, there was no happiness in him. At his funeral in 1894, based on instructions he gave before his death, Taylor's body was attended not by a minister, but by a fiddler who played the popular tune, Napoleon's Retreat. Or perhaps based on local tradition, there were two or three fiddlers. Local legend has it that a fiddler played a, a bawdy song in his grave and went mad, a sign of divine vengeance. In any case, 
on Taylor's grave marker, uh, they gave him the title Governor of, of North Carolina. All right. I'm, I'm, those are my remarks. Uh, Mr. Longley, actually. Pardon? Mr. Longley. Mr. Longley. Yep. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Um, most famous example was Tennessee, where Lincoln appointed um, Andrew Johnson. That's how he uh, got to be vice president. So that's probably what, maybe what you're thinking of. And uh, he also appointed uh, military governors in Louisiana and Arkansas. Uh, I haven't done as much research on those two states, but definitely in Tennessee, uh, Andrew Johnson had a bit better of a record, uh, or, or is considered to have a bit better of a record than in Stanley, which is why he uh, ended up as uh, vice president. 